is. My name is Dr. Shani Lalani. I am a board certified internal medicine hospitalist, and I am also a palliative care and hospice doctor. I'll go over what my specialty does, and I'll go through a case with you. So the way I want this lecture to set up is that I am going to present a case, and it's going to be like an actual shadow session where you're going to be with me, and we're going to go through everything I'll be thinking of you know, from what I think of the patient to the pathophysiology behind what I do um, and what I'm thinking and why I'm using a certain medication. So I hope it's going to be a great learning experience for you. And then I'm also going to touch on a really important topic that I usually talk about with medical students on how to deal with a patient's death. Um, I feel like this is not a topic that's openly discussed as much, and I think it's very important to discuss this topic openly. Um, I know this is a little bit of a heavier topic, but if you go into the field of medicine, whether you choose being a physician or nurse practitioner or PA or nurse or tech, whatever you do, you will at one point in your career deal with a patient's death, and it's important to talk about this topic openly and how to deal with it. Um, so we'll go through the case. Um, I also want to say that, you know, the case is pretty heavy um, and, you know, I deal with very acute and sick patients, um, but if you feel like this is a lot, don't let it turn you off from medicine. There are other specialties in medicine that don't deal with such high acuity cases, and this is just not a reflection of, you know, all specialties in medicine, but this is a reflection of my specialty in medicine, um, and so I really hope you learn a lot during this session. So a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Dallas, Texas. I went to UT Austin for undergrad, and then I moved to New York City for medical school. I went to Toro College. Um, I did my residency in internal medicine, um, and then in Brooklyn, New York, and I did my fellowship in palliative care and hospice at NYU School of Medicine. And so what I do is that I am an internal medicine hospitalist. So a hospitalist is someone that manages your care when you're admitted into the hospital. So for example, let's say a patient goes to the emergency room, they are coming into the emergency room with a chest pain. So the emergency room doctor, the ER doctor will say, okay, this patient is probably having a heart attack and they need to be admitted into the hospital. And so I am the doctor that will be managing the patient inside the hospital from start to finish till their discharge. And then I coordinate care with other specialties in medicine. So I'm kind of like the go-to doctor for different specialties. So let's say if this patient came into my service for chest pain, then I contact the cardiologist who's the heart doctor to see, okay, does this patient, you know, need to be treated? What's going on? Is he having a heart attack? Does he need to go for a cardiac cath, which is a procedure to look at the arteries of the heart? So I'm kind of the middle person. And as a hospitalist, depending if it's an academic or non-academic setting, my hours are usually 12-hour shifts, seven on, seven off. So I work seven days straight for 12 hours. I have a week off, and then I do seven-day stretch again, 12-hour shifts. On my weeks off, I do palliative care and hospice, which is what mostly I'm gonna focus on. Um, I am also a locum doctor. So what a locum doctor is a travel doctor. So you know how there's travel nursing, there's also travel doctors. So a locum doctor goes to hospital where there's a severe shortage of doctors. So most of the time, I live in New York City, New York City is my base and I work in hospitals in New York City majority of the time, but then, one week out of the month or sometimes two weeks out of the month, I go to um, different areas in the United States where there's a shortage of doctors. And most of the times, these areas are rural hospitals and rural areas in the U.S. When I was done with fellowship, you know, when I finished my training and I wanted to start working, I wanted to take about a year or two off to just kind of, you know, travel and see different hospital settings. And my initial goal was actually to go out of country to help in countries that need, you know, help and have shortage of doctors. But when I started doing my research, I realized there's so many areas in the United States that have such a shortage of doctors and shortage of healthcare personnel. And when I started doing research, I found that there, there are these locum companies that 
you know, fly you to these areas, put you in a hotel for like a couple of days or a week, how much ever long, long your contract is. And you can work in these rural areas um, all over the country and help out there. So that's been very rewarding for me. I've been doing rural medicine for about two, three years now. And one week out of the month or two weeks out of the month, I usually go to these areas to help out. And I've met the most incredible humans and other doctors from all over the country. Um, and then, you know, especially during the pandemic, during COVID, the area that needed most help was actually New York City. So for five, for five, about five or six months, um, I was working as a hospitalist at a pop-up facility in New York City where, uh, you know, we were housing everyone that, you know, the hospitals were getting packed. So when the hospitals were packed, they were sending patients to this facility that was funded by FEMA and the government. And so that was also a very crazy and rewarding experience, you know, working front lines in New York City at the pop-up facilities here has, has truly been the most incredible learning experience. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of pros of being a locum's physician, and if you have any questions about that, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to answer that later. I also lend my voice in the media, especially, you know, during the pandemic, uh, just being front lines in New York City just gave me so much exposure to what's going on. So, you know, I've been active with the news, doing podcasts, writing articles, um, and that's also very rewarding, be able to kind of give back to the community and spread awareness of different topics. Um, and I also practice preventative medicine on the side. So I do a little bit of everything, which I think is the best part about medicine. You don't have to do just one thing. And that's something you'll realize when you're in residency, you'll realize that you don't have to do just one field. You can you know, learn about different fields. You can do different specialties. You can practice however you want. And that's the most incredible thing about how medicine is changing. Most physicians are not just doing one thing. So now I'm gonna go through a case and we're gonna focus on the palliative care and hospice side. So Mrs. Smith is a 45 year old female. She has stage four metastatic breast cancer and she's admitted to the hospital with severe pain in the hip, lower extremities, upper extremities due to bone metastasis. Her disease has progressed and she is more tired with decreased ambulation. She follows with the oncology clinic regularly and is currently not a candidate for chemotherapy due to progression of her disease. You are consulted for pain management and goals of care. A little bit of background on this patient's social history. She is married with three children. She used to work as a biology teacher and she is very involved in her church and community. So just an overview again, she's 45 year old female with stage four metastatic breast cancer came into the hospital with severe pain. Um, her disease has progressed. Uh, oncology has not told her yet that she is no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. So she's reaching the end of her disease. Um, and you're consulted for pain management and goals of care. She has three children. She's a biology teacher. She's involved in the community. So now that I'm looking at this case, my first thought process is that, you know, I'm consulted as a palliative care provider to provide pain and symptom relief. So what is palliative care? So palliative care is a field of medicine that focuses on anyone with a chronic serious illness. So it could be someone with cancer like this patient, it could be someone with end-stage heart disease, end-stage lung disease, end-stage kidney disease, um, dementia. So any chronic illness, and my job as a palliative care doctor is to provide relief of symptoms. We are heavily trained in pain management, symptom management, using different types of drugs to manage symptoms such as dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing or nausea, vomiting or any other symptoms these end stage patients and stage um, disease patients might be having. And then my job is also to provide support to patients and family. Palliative care, as a palliative care provider, we work in a interdisciplinary team which means it's not just me that sees the patient, but I have a team that I work with. So I work with the palliative care NP, nurse practitioner. I work with the palliative care nurse, social worker, and chaplain. Um, and this is so we can address patients' physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. 
one of the best things I like about palliative care is that we take the human approach. You know, we're not just looking at patients for their pain, but we're, we're taking the whole mind, body, and soul approach and looking at patient as a whole. Um, it can be provided with curative treatment. So we're also involved in patient's care. Let's say someone has cancer and they're getting chemotherapy and they're getting better. And if they have symptoms that need to be managed, we're still there. So it's not just for patients that are end of life, it's for anyone that has a chronic illness. Hospice, on the other hand, the way I describe palliative care and hospice is that they're two separate fields under the same umbrella. So hospice is specifically for patients that have a life expectancy of six months or less. So palliative care can be for anyone with a chronic illness. Hospice, on the other hand, is for patients that have six months or less to live. Patients are, you know, people usually think of hospice as like a place people go to, but it's actually a service that is provided. And so it's, an, it's not so much of a place, but a service that's provided by Medicare and Medicaid, and it can be provided anywhere. So there's home hospice. Home hospice is where the patient decides that they want to die at home. They want to die comfortably at home, surrounded by family and friends in their bed. That's home hospice. And there is hospice can be provided at a nursing home because there are people that don't have homes and live in nursing homes. Hospice can be provided inpatient. So when someone's in the hospital and they're actively dying, um, that's when they, their bed can be converted into a hospice room and, and all of us providers are coming in to providing care and comfort. The goal of hospice is to provide comfort and, and ideally, you know, the best environment we believe a patient can die is at home in their own bed. So that's always very rewarding to see that happen because the most comfortable, patients are usually most comfortable when they're at home. Um, and again, the criteria for hospice is six months or less. So when I'm doing my hospice week, so I do a palliative care week, which is basically a consult service that is provided at hospitals. And when I do my hospice week, I make home house calls, uh, which, is, which is very interesting because you know not a lot of doctors do that anymore, but it's what doctors used to do back in the day in the 17 and 1800s. Um, and, and it's really great being able to, you know, visit a patient's home and see them in their own environment and be able to provide medical care when the patients are at home. So, so it's very rewarding, it's very different, and it definitely adds variety to my care. So again, it, we work in an interdisciplinary team. It's not just me um, as a physician, but I also work with a nurse, the nurse practitioner, the social worker, the chaplain, there's grief counselors, there's therapists, um, there's acupuncturists, there's um, sound healers, there's so many people on our team. Um, and we always try to do the whole mind, body and soul approach. Um, so the approach to palliative care is for pain and symptom management, like for this patient, psychosocial approach, you know, for this patient, she has three children, she's married. I wanna make sure that, you know, her children are aware of what's going on. And I want to make sure I'm able to provide support to not just her, but also to her family, her children. I would probably involve the social worker in this case to make sure that, you know, they're as comfortable as possible and, and they're understanding what's going on and if they need any help at home. And also in the case I mentioned, she's religious. Religion is a big part of her care. So, you know, I want to target that aspect of her care as well. And I would involve the chaplain. So I'll go over each of these. Um, and again, I take the mind, body, and soul approach and look at patient as a whole. So again, with the case, the 45-year-old female, stage four metastatic breast cancer, she's coming in with pain, hit pain in her lower extremity, upper extremity because of the bone metastasis. Um, oncology is now gonna tell her that she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. And I'm consulted for pain management and goals of care. She is married with three children, has a biology teacher, and she's involved in her community. So my first job is pain management. You won't be able to really have any conversation with patients regarding you know, her goals of care, what she would want if she's in unbearable pain. So the first thing I would do when I see her is evaluate her for her pain. And you know, we take a very, very detailed approach and get a very detailed pain history. So the cool thing about the way pain works is that, you know, when someone is in pain, 
depending on the type of pain they are. There are these receptors that are targeted in the body that send a signal to your brain, telling your brain you are in pain. And so the goal of pain management, depending on the type of um, pain you are having, is to target these receptors. So for example, opioids target the delta receptors, which send pain signals to your brain, telling your brain that you're in pain. And so that's why depending on the type of pain someone's in, we target these opioid receptors or delta receptors or kappa receptors or mu receptors uh, based on the type of pain someone is having. And so when I would see her, I would ask her a detailed pain history. I would ask her what type of pain she's having, what's the quality of the pain, is it sharp, is it stabbing, is it burning, is it tingling, does it radiate anywhere, Where did the, when did the pain start? You know, if the pain started about a week ago, um, I would want to make sure that she's not having a fracture. I want to make sure that there's not a new bone lesion that's coming up, which would make me think, okay, maybe I need to get an x-ray if this is a new type of pain. Maybe it's a new bone lesion that's showing up. Um, is, you know, what else is going on? What's, you know, did you already try medications at home? Did you try Tylenol at home? Is it working? because I don't wanna start her on high dose opioids without trying something low dose first. Um, you know, what is just kind of, kind of really getting the nitty gritty detail on her pain. And so I wanna kind of go over a little bit about the type of pains that exist, right? So there's somatic type of pain, which is basically a pain when receptors in the tissues are targeted. So skin, muscle, joints, and these are activated um, with stimuli such as force, temperature, vibration. So the best way to think of somatic pain is when someone breaks a bone, you know, that's a somatic type of pain. And what will happen is that usually this is described as cramping and gnawing type pain. So that's why when I'm asking her detailed pain history, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm asking her what type of pain are you having? Because if she's describing this cramping type of pain, this sharp stabbing type of thing, pain. I'm thinking, okay, this is likely a somatic type of pain. And then nociceptive pain is just a general medical term used for physical damage or potential damage to the body. So this might be like a dental procedure or arthritis. Neuropathic pain is when there is, um, when there's injury to the nerves. And so this I usually described as like diabetic patients that coming in with nerve pain, like diabetic foot nerve pain. And usually this pain is described as burning and tingling. And that's why getting a detailed pain history is so important. So in this case, since it's a bone metastatic pain, it's not a neuropathic pain. She's probably not gonna describe it as burning and tingling. What she's probably gonna be describing it is as a sharp and crampy, which is gonna tell me, okay, this is more a somatic nociceptive type of pain, which will help me determine the type of medications to use. Because neuropathic pain is treated differently with different medications than somatic nociceptive type of pain. So in this case, the pain I would say is a somatic nociceptive type of bone pain. And I would ask if she's used, you know, Tylenol or any other medications at home. And what I would be treating her with, depending on the severity of her symptoms, is opioids. So I know opioids get a bad rep because of the opioid pain crisis, but there is a place for opioids. And treating these patients that have cancer and severe pain is a place for them. And so we're very careful when we're using these opioids. You know, we always do a background check um, to check in the EPR, EPRS system to make sure that no other providers have prescribed them opioids, kind of screen them for addiction type, type things, especially if we're gonna be pres prescribing them opioids long-term. And so, the type of opioids, you know, there are different types of opioids. There's morphine, there's oxycodone, there's dilaudid, there's fentanyl. And for this patient, based on their kidney function and liver function, I would decide what type of opioid to use. So if she has a bad kidney, bad kidney function, I would not be using morphine because I know that morphine metabolites can build up in her body because of kidney damage. So I would probably go to a different type of opioid, either dilaudid or fentanyl, depending on, you know, her liver function, her kidney function. 
if she's used these opioids before and been able to handle it. So there's a lot going on when I'm thinking of, okay, the type of opioid I need to use for this patient. The most common side effects that happens when I prescribe opioids is um, constipation, nausea, vomiting, drowsiness. I always prescribe stool softeners and stimulants to make sure that the patients are not developing constipation because once opioids start causing constipation, it could lead to, you know, if it's untreated for several days or weeks, it can lead to bowel obstruction. So the goal is always do no harm. So the first thing I would be doing is also prescribing them stool softeners. You know, the nausea, vomiting are usually self-limiting as in they usually tend to go away in a couple of days once the body gets used to it. And, you know, everyone is monitored in a setting, especially when if I'm going to be prescribing high dose opioids. Um, the other thing I would be thinking of, let's say if it's in her case, the pain is pretty widespread. It's in her hips, in her lower extremities, upper extremities. If someone is coming in with just one site of pain, and if I do an x-ray or any other imaging and I just see one lesion, I would probably also recommend radiation therapy that tends to help with bone pain but that would all depend on the lesion, the bone lesion, where it is, if it's metastasized to several sites or one site. So then again, that's why it's so important to get a detailed pain history. So that's the pain aspect of our care. So once I deal with the pain management side of things, then I would, so I can address different areas of her care. I would move on to the psychosocial side. So again, we always deal with the mind, body, and soul approach. Uh, she has three children and she's currently married. That's a big part of her personhood. That's a big part of who she is as a human. And so I would make sure to provide support to not just her, but also her family. And I would get the social worker involved to see, you know, do we need like a grief therapist? Do we need a therapist to be able to talk to children to understand, depending on their age, what's going on with their mother since, you know, now she has metastatic cancer and she's not going to be getting chemotherapy. You know, the patient's also a biology teacher. So let's say if this is early on in her disease and she wants to continue to teach, you know, my job is to make sure she's able to do that. So I would adjust her medications. I would adjust her pain medications in a way that she's not too drowsy. She's able to teach how much ever long she wants. Obviously, she's going to reach a point where she's not able, she's not going to be able to do that. But we want to preserve function and we want to preserve this patient's personhood as long as possible. And that's where I come in on the medication side, on the on the physician side. And then the psychosocial aspect would be the social worker on my team, um, really offering support along with the entire team. And then we also have the palliative care chaplain who plays a very important role in patient's care. When someone gets really, really sick, there are so many aspects that go into a patient's care just beyond pain management. So sometimes what we see with patients that are getting really sick is, you know, if they're religion or religious or religious is a big part of their life, they might think, okay, is God punishing me? Is, you know, am I supposed to be suffering or what's going on? And that's why having a palliative care chaplain on our team is so important to address these spiritual needs. I want to make sure this patient's not going to be having an existential crisis that could be impacting her care. Um, and, and for this patient, she's Christian and, and it's a big part of her being. So I want to be able to address that aspect of care as well. So now, you know, going through the spiritual psychosocial side, now I would be meeting with the oncologist, you know, me and the oncologist would be on the team together. And the oncologist would now tell me these type of cases that, okay, we need to tell the patient that she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. And so that's breaking bad news. You know, whenever you know, we break bad news, for example, in this patient telling them she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. It's never something I take lightly. I know I am about to give patients information that's going to be life-changing um, and it's really going to impact them. And so there are tools that, you know, we learn in training, especially during my palliative care fellowship uh, that kind of help me deliver this bad news in a constructive manner. And so I kind of want to go over, you know, since you're not able to shadow me in person, I want to kind of go over what would happen um, when I'm breaking this bad news to patient. And this is breaking bad news is something all specialties will do. And there's, there's, you want to make sure you're a good communicator when you are, you know, addressing patients. It, it makes a difference when you are professional and communicate things properly and explain things clear, clearly to patients. It, 
it really makes a lasting impact for them and their families. So now we've reached in a case where I've met with the oncologist and we're gonna tell them, okay, you are no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. So I like to use what I, what I refer to as the SPIKES protocol. So the S is setting up the interview, okay? So I would be in the patient's room with the oncologist. I would ask the patient if there's anyone else you would want involved in this meeting. Um, you know, it, most of the times it's not just the patient, but it's, it's family, their children, um, their husband, parents, friends, whoever they want present. And then I would make sure that everyone is sitting comfortably. Everyone's able to concentrate and be part of the discussions comfortably. You know, I would make sure the room is quiet. I don't want to break this bad news in the room when Jerry Springer is in the background. I just want to make sure everything's quiet and, and, and it's a good setup because setups matter. And then I would assess the patient's understanding of what's going on. So I would do like an open-ended question like, okay, what is your understanding of what's going on so far with your disease? What has the oncologist or the hospitalist told you about what's going on? And then the patient would say like, you know, I have stage four breast metastatic cancer um, that's progressed to the bones and that's why I'm here for pain management. Um, I'm currently on chemotherapy or not on chemotherapy. And it's really important to assess their understanding because in so many cases, you will find out that you might be doing a great job communicating with these patients, but they're not really listening or understanding the same way you would want to. So assessing their understanding before giving them news is, is extremely important. And then I would ask them, is it okay if I share information with you regarding your care or regarding your chemotherapy or regarding, you know, whatever that it is, for example, in this case, is it okay if I share information with, you, with the, not, the oncologist and I have been talking about your care and progression of the disease? Do you want this information? And it's always really important to ask the patient, do you want this information before just handing it to them, before just being like, oh, by the way, you're no longer a candidate for chemotherapy. Because asking these Asking this question, is it okay if I share, kind of assesses their preparedness. But also, you will notice that when you start practicing medicine, there are cultural differences. So let's say, you know, a lot of patients that come from a very traditional Chinese background would rather have the information delivered to the eldest son or another family member as opposed to getting the information themselves. And so being culturally aware is extremely important. Um, especially, you know, somewhere like New York City, where you see people from all over the world um, and treat people from all over the world, you realize that everyone comes from a cultural background and they might not want the information. They'd rather just give it to the family members. So it's important to assess that. And then we share the information with them. I would tell them, you know, the oncologist, you know, just has said that you're no longer a candidate for chemotherapy um, because, you know, the harm, it, it's, harm, doing more harm than good, whatever it is that we would be sharing. And then you assess their emotional response. And that's the most important part. You want to make sure that you're telling them that I'm going to be here for you as the doctor or, you know, as the provider, no matter what. I'm going to be here to make sure you're as comfortable as possible. I'm going to be here to make sure that you're taken care of as much as possible and I'm not going to be abandoning you. And so that's so important. Um, and then in the end, you just want to summarize you know, okay, so this is what we decided, this is what we're gonna do. So that's that's kind of like how I break bad news going through this protocol. And then, you know, we're also consulted for goals of care. Goals of care meaning that now that I've told her she's no longer a candidate for chemotherapy, um, would she want CPR? Which is, you know, when you try to do chest compression and intubate the patient, would you wanna go naturally? A lot of patients, someone that has dementia and has like 90 years old and has, you know, a lot of times patients tell their family that when that time comes, I just want to go naturally. I don't want to have CPR. Some patients might say, I still want to try. I want to try, you know, and then you have to kind of ask, like, how long would you want to try for? You, you kind of just get to know them. And in the end, it's always the patient's decision. But you always get to know them to assess, you know, what are your goals and, and what do you want? Um, because in, in, our, in the end, our job is to make sure whatever their goals and wishes are, um, we're doing whatever it is that they want and we're not doing unnecessary damage. Um, so let's say in this case, she's DNR, DNI, which means 
when the time comes, she wants to go naturally. So now I'm gonna switch gears into talking about, you know, dealing with a patient's death. And so now you are the resident on call and you are notified. So patients readmitted to the hospital because she's having worsening symptoms and, and she's getting worse. Um, and so now you're readmitted to the hospital and you, you, the patient's readmitted to the hospital and you're notified um, that Mrs. Smith has died at 2 a.m. and you are called to pronounce her and do a death exam. So before you walk into the patient's room to do a death exam, there's gonna be a few things you do. So first you are gonna make sure that you're gonna check her code status, which is, you know, you're gonna have to make sure that she's DNR, DNI or full code. If she's full code, which means she wants CPR, you would initiate CPR right away. But if she's DNR, DNI, then, you know, you would not initiate CPR. So it's really important to check their code status. It's also very important to do a quick chart review because what you'll notice when you're in residency is that a lot of times you're asked to see these patients that you've never seen before or never followed before. And you wanna have a little bit of brief background on them medically about what's going on. So you wanna be able to kind of, you know, have a brief summary, like, okay, this patient is this much, and this is her age. She came in because she had metastatic cancer and this is what she's being treated for here. And this is what happened. So you wanna have a little bit of medical background. Um, if there are family or friends um, around, do you want to make sure you're introducing yourself and you're offering your condolences? Um, you know, you, you want to be mindful of everyone that is around um, and, and just the circumstance of what was going on. And then you would be performing a death exam. This is something you will be taught in residency. So, you know, you, there is a lot of things that we do when we're performing a death exam. We're checking their heart sounds, we're auscultating their heart, their lungs, we're checking their pupillary reflex, um, we're checking their carotid pulse, we're checking their um, radial pulse. Um, so, you know, especially during COVID time, you wanna make sure you're wearing proper PPE before you're going in and coming out. And there's a few things that happen. Let's say someone is admitted to the ICU and you're assessing them from brain death. There's an apnea test that's performed. So. So there are all these tests that are performed that you'd be learning about in residency. So now I kind of want to just talk about, you know, dealing with a patient's death. So death is a normal part of life, but that does not mean it's easier. Um, seeing a patient die is, is not normal, you know, you, you know, but it's something all of us in medicine will see, whether you're a medical student, resident, nurse, physician, or any other medical provider. This is something you will experience in your career. Um, no matter what field in medicine you go into, um, obviously not all fields in medicine see death regularly. And I do more since I am a hospice doctor, um, but, but it is something you will see even in training. So first thing I would say is that it's important to express your emotions, uh, especially if you got close to the patient, let yourself feel the loss, you know? You will get close to people that you do medical school with or you do your residency with. So talk about your feelings openly with your colleagues you know, tell them that, you know, I was managing this patient for like a week or two weeks and I got so close to her and I'm so sad that she died. Um, and she was so young and she had children. And, and, and that's how, you know, it's important to just express these emotions, whatever you're feeling, because it's not easy, but it's important to talk about it openly. And take time to reflect. You just saw a human being lose their life. And so, you know, everyone takes loss in their own way. Take, take some time to reflect. Um, one of the books I always recommend is Uncle Gawande's Being Mortal. Um, it's important to read books like these, not just medical books, but to kind of just read about the human side of medicine, you know? And then dispel any feelings of failure. You can't control if someone gets metastatic cancer. You can't control if someone has a chronic illness. And so it's important that you understand that if someone dies, it, it's not a failure on your end. And as physicians, we're doing the best we can to provide care. And if things get hard, speak to a licensed therapist. If you start feeling like, okay, you're losing sleep, you're unable to eat, you're losing weight, um, you're unable to concentrate, you're unable to take care of patients, then it's time you see a licensed psychiatrist because that means that this is impacting you um, more than it should and that, you know, it's important to take care of yourself mentally and mental health is really important. And it's important that you recognize that in yourself that, okay, this has been a lot. 
and seek help because if you are unable to seek help, you won't be able to help other patients. So that's just kind of a summary. Now I just kind of want to give, you know, switch gears. And I mean, I, first of all, I just want to say this was a very tough topic talking about, you know, metastatic cancer and, and dealing with someone's death and what we do is just not easy. But I really commend you for sitting here and listening through this. Um, and now I'm just going to switch gears before I can answer questions. So advice for medical school. So I would say the first thing is, you know, get a mentor, shadow doctors. I know it's been really difficult during COVID because none of us want to take in students. Um, we don't want to expose anyone, especially in New York City where cases have been so high. But when things get better, um, you know, just reach out to doctors. I mean, when I was in college, um, I was part of all these medical associations that kind of exposed me to different, you know, physicians I can contact. Um, but a lot of times I was cold calling physicians being like, hey, I'm part of like this medical association. Is it okay if I shadow you? You know, I don't have parents that are doctors. Um, I don't have um, anyone in my family that were doctors. I felt like I had to figure a lot out on my own and you kind of have to hustle, you know, you kind of have to kind of just be your best advocate and reach out to as many people as possible. Volunteer, you know, most of us going to medicine to help people. And so volunteering shows that you want to help people um, and this is how you're giving back. You know, I always was involved in volunteer organization, not just in high school, but also through college and even in medical school. Study early, apply early. These tests are a marathon. It's not something you can just, you know, binge overnight and then take the test next morning. We always study, you have to study way in advance. So make sure you're applying early. I remember applying to medical school right when the portal opened up you will be able to upload documents and recommendation letters before everything is even ready to be submitted. Um, and then, you know, get involved in extracurricular activities like this organization or other organizations you can be a part of to just show that, you know, what you can handle, you know, different activities and, and you have a range to you and then you're not just focused on medicine and that you like other, you have other interests. It's always good to be well-rounded. And then most importantly, I think it's so important to be humble and to be kind. I feel like the best doctors I've met are just really genuinely good human beings. You know, they want to help people, but they're also kind and they're not just intelligent, also very humble. Um, and, and that always carries through to your patients. You know, patients always like doctors that are just nice human beings and just truly genuinely care about them. So I want to leave some time for questions. I hope that was helpful. This was so great. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you know, thank we really you. think it takes a special person to do what you're doing. So thank you for thank that. You. Um, there are many messages in the chat, just thanking you for talking about such a hard topic. No um, worries. And there were tons of questions about a wide range of topics. So we can go ahead and start um, picking some out for you. Okay. And so I think one of the main questions that people had was, um, do, you, do you feel that as a DO, you have a different approach to the mind, body, soul aspect of palliative mm -hmm. care, hospice, or what do you think the main differences are in a hospice physician between M MDs and DOs? Yeah, so I think palliative care in general has a mind, body, and soul approach. So I definitely think be, being a DO had always helped me with that aspect because that's just like the type of training you receive in medical school. Um, but I think you could, you know, D or MD aside, I think palliative care in general uses a mind, body, and soul approach. And, and so many palliative care providers are MDs and DOs. Um, but definitely having a DO background did help a little. Um, but but it, it all just depends on and the route you choose. Um, there, there was an interesting question when you mentioned that um, the criteria is six months for hospice. And mm -hmm. so someone asked, what happens if the patient actually ends up living longer than six months? Are cases mm -hmm. evaluated often or how often does that even happen? Yeah, so we're, they're actually evaluated for admission into hospice every two months. There's a few quarters that we have to evaluate the patient. And there's so many times where patients actually discharge from hospice. You know, they initially we think their life expectancy is less than six months, but then they start doing better or they start responding and to chemotherapy. And so then they're discharged from hospice. Sometimes patients that 
take longer to die. You know, let's say if someone has dementia, uh, which is like a course that's a lot more complicated and it's harder to predict, um, patients end up, you know, sort of being like a year on hospice. So you can always get recertified. What we're looking at is that constant decline in function. So as long as patients continue to have a decline in function, they're always going to be eligible for hospice based on you know, how they're doing. So some patients stay on more than six months, a year, two years even. Um, it all just depends. It's very individualized to patient. And then some patients get discharged, which is always great when they get discharged. We want patients to get discharged from hospice. Um, so so it, it, it really depends. Thank you for that. Um, there were a lot of questions. Kind of, um, a lot of questions asking about how you um, kind of handle um, take or providing care for people that have a wide range of different religious beliefs, and you know how that how you're really trained to handle and take on different cultural backgrounds. Yeah, so I think that definitely comes through practice. Um, just being mindful of different cultural backgrounds is so important, especially, you know, one of the things we're blessed with living in this country is that we treat patients from so many different cultural backgrounds. And so when you are in training or in medical school and residency, you will notice these cultural backgrounds and how they transfer um, to the medical care, you know, and, and, and just being mindful of the fact that everyone has a different culture background they could be coming from that impacts their decision making is, is so important. And so it's just something you'll learn in residency, kind of doing it more. Um, you know, I was blessed to do residency in New York City where, you know, there's so many cultural backgrounds. And so you learn that you learn that, okay, this culture responds this way, this religious group just responds this way. Um, and this is what they usually tend to choose or not choose. So just being in training will definitely just expose you to that. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's really cool. I guess kind of shifting gears. Um, do you use um, TENS units to manage nerve pain or is it something that you would recommend that you know patients would do at home if they experience that? What, what for nerve pain? What was the medication? Tens units, like the little like things that you put onto your body. Oh, no, like, yeah, the pins you... units. Yeah. Um. So, so the nerve pain usually I end up treat. So diabetic nerve pain is different. You know, that's more like primary care specialty. The nerve pain I end up treating most of the times because I see such sicker patients is it's just so much more advanced than the pins and needles type pain. It is you know usually because of a malignant tumor that's suppressing on a nerve and which is like a whole different type of nerve pain. So we usually end up using like anti-epileptics or drugs like gabapentin um, to manage these nerve pains. The pins and needles is great, especially if someone has like diabetic nerve pain, but the nerve pain I end up treating is just a lot more severe. Great, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. So there were some clarifying questions about palliative care specialists in general. People are asking, are most palliative care physicians internal medicine physicians as well? Um, they had this kind of preconceived notion that it was typically like oncology specialties or physicians in that field. Yeah. So, on, so you know, palliative care special, so the specialty of palliative care, there are few specialties that can go into it. So I did my residency in internal medicine and I practiced mostly as an internal medicine hospitalist, but then I also do palliative care. So you, I, so it's a, since it's a specialty, you need your residency first. So most residency, people that do residency, internal medicine go into it, but also family medicine can go into it. Um, also, I've seen psych residencies go into it. I've seen PMNR, pain medication and re, uh, rehab go into it. So there's like about four to five specialties that able, is able to apply for this fellowship. So at Powder Can Hospice is one year fellowship. Uh, so you do your residency, you know, whether it is internal medicine for three years or family medicine for three years or psych and, and few specialties is able to go into it. There are times where oncologist, uh, you know, oncology is a fellowship as well. So you do your residency in internal medicine for three years, which is needed for oncology. And then you apply to oncology, um, which is three years in itself. 
So a lot of times, you know, people don't do palliative care and hospice on top of oncology. Um, but there are sometimes people go into um, intensivists, like the pulmonary critical care fellowship and do palliative care. So it's just a year and you can add it to any other specialty as well. But most people that go into it do internal medicine or family medicine. Great, thank you for clarifying that for us. No worries. Um, so you mentioned that you mainly deal with uh, acute patients and those that are in real, like in immediate distress. Um, mm -hmm. But you also deal with those who have chronic diseases such as HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, degenerative mm -hmm. diseases. Yes. Yeah, so I deal with all sorts of patients. So when I'm doing hospice, you know, I'm seeing patients that are very sick at home, whether it's home hospice, but palliative care could be for anyone. There's also outpatient palliative care clinics that some physicians run. Um, so palliative care can be with anyone with chronic illness, you know, and that includes HIV and end stage kidney disease and heart disease. And we see them usually at the end of their, um, at the end or in the middle of their disease progression, um, just to kind of get to know them, manage their symptoms. So for example, you know, let's say if someone has end stage um, heart failure, we would ideally like to be consulted early on in their disease progression. So we're able to kind of talk to them about, you know, their wishes, like get to know them at a deeper level to ask them, you know, if your heart, heart failure progresses more, would you want CPR or kind, you know, or would you want to go naturally? So kind of initiate these conversations early on when they're able to talk and able to communicate. Um, and then also, you know, manage them for any symptoms they might be having, for example, dyspnea, you know, that's a common symptoms we see with someone with end stage heart failure. So. So I, so we definitely see the entire range. Thank you. Someone, um, actually a few people asked about how you think the healthcare system in the U.S. and the financial status of patients or their families can affect the care that they'll get in hospice or even their ability to um, go into hospice. Yeah, so hospice is covered by Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so if that, so, you know, so they cover the service that's provided. So, so when they're, let's say, for example, they're on home hospice, it's covered by the government, technically, if they have Medicare, Medicaid, um, there's always like additional help that's needed because, so what happens is when someone's on home hospice, the doctor visits them at home about once a week or twice a week. The nurse visits them a couple of times a week, depending on, you know, their acuity but they always need to have a family member present at home to kind of help them with everything because we can't be there every day, every single day, 24 hours a day. And so most of those patients have home health aid that's set up, but also uh, a lot of times family members have to be around. So, you know, financial situations of patients does impact um, the type of care they may be able to receive, but there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of, organizations that are um, set up to kind of help aid in this matter. Obviously, if someone is undocumented, that becomes a little difficult to have them on home hospice because, you know, they usually don't have Medicare, Medicaid, which is a common thing we see in New York. So that's definitely difficult to deal with. But there are sometimes um, organizations set up to, you know, there's um, organizations to kind of set up help these patients to with the financial burden of things, but but it's always difficult. You know, we're not always able to help everyone as as much as we would like. Yeah, that's that's good to know that there are organizations for that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess another question that we got a lot um, when you're talking about um, sitting down with the family and the patient um, when giving bad news. What have you had any really like? quote unquote, bad experiences um, or difficult experiences with family members really not taking the news well or resisting um, or not wanting to even hear the news at all? Yeah, I mean, that I feel like that happens like half the time or more than half the time, you know, like we're, we're giving very critical information to patients and, and the fi family dynamics are always different. You know, ideally would, we would love if things just went smoothly and we were giving the news and the patient was understanding and family understanding. But, but I would say half the time, it's not like that. The reality of the situation is that family dynamics are tricky, you know, um, 
not everyone sometimes is on the same page. The patient might want one thing, but the family members want something else. You know, people sometimes end up in arguments and fights and all these things happen. But but that's just, you know, kind of aspects of practicing medicine with humans. Human beings are complex and it, it, things are never just as easy as we would want them to be. But but you learn how to handle different situations and that obviously comes with more and more training and more and more practice. Um, but but there are so many times things just don't go as planned. Um, but but that's just part of it. Great, thank you for that. Um, so there were several questions asking about pediatric hospice. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when you think of hospice, you think of old people who are at the end of their life. Yeah. And so how often do you personally work with pediatric population? And is there a certain pediatric palliative care specialty or is that something that you learn along the way? Yeah, so it's definitely something we're trained in in fellowship. Um, you know, we go, you, you do these different rotations and then we do our pediatric care, uh, pediatric palliative care fellowship. And that's definitely a tough topic, but there are nurse practitioners and physicians that do palli pediatric palliative care. So let's say if someone did their pediatric residency um, in res re their residency in pediatrics, a lot of times those patients or those doctors want to do palliative care fellowship so they could treat their pediatric population. Um, sometimes, you know, at these pediatric hospitals, like that are solely treating pediatric patients, they have palliative care doctors that are specialized in pediatric care. I am trained in it. Um, and I do see some pediatric cases in the hospital, but there are other people with me that are higher trained in it. So there could be like a pediatric care nurse practitioner that comes along with me um, because it's important to kind of understand that everyone has a different training. Majority of my training is with adults, but I'm not gonna just not take help from someone that has a lot more training in it. Um, and so that's why, it's, you know, I always emphasize the interdisciplinary team approach. We work as a team. Um, and, and we kind of like look at everyone's strength to assess the patient who can help the patient the best. Um, but in hospice, we do see, um, you know, we have a good amount of pediatric patients as well, um, which is always kind of the harder cases because, you know, with, depending on the child's age, a lot of times they're too young and, and, and it's really more difficult for the parents than it is for the child sometimes, so. Thank you for talking about that. We can only imagine how hard it must be. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and wrap up here. So I guess for our final question for you, um, what advice would you leave us pre-med students with, um, especially now with COVID going on and for the foreseeable future? Yeah, no, I think, I think one advice I always give um, pre-med students is first to just keep an open mind you know, whenever you're looking at different specialties, don't, don't, you know, you might think right now you want to do surgery, you might think right now you want to do internal medicine, and this and that, but it's important to just have an open mind and, and look at all specialties openly, uh, because you never know what you want to do till you actually do it. There's so many of my colleagues that went into it thinking they were going to be surgeons, but did their surgery rotations, they were like, no, this is not for me, or went into internal medicine, and they did their surgery rotation and realized, oh, this is so great. So, just keep an open mind. And then secondly, just have fun, you know, medicine, it, it's, it, there's a lot going on, it's tough, but it should, but if this is something you truly want to, you know, pursue, you should also enjoy the ride. You know, I felt like I always enjoyed my experience in medical school, or even being a pre-med and, and, and learning about medicine. I was like, wow, this is so cool. You know, I'm, I'm such a nerd, you know, <laughs> I was like, this is the best learning about science, because I always loved science growing up. And, and put, putting that science to be able to help people is very, very rewarding. So it's something you should be excited about and have fun with. Great, thank you again so much for joining no us. No problem, no problem. It's an amazing session. And like we said, you know, we really appreciate you teaching us about this challenging topic. Yeah, no worries. You can always reach me um, on my Instagram. It's dr.lalani if you have any questions, um, Dr. Lalani. I always try to reply as much as I can. Sometimes I might not get to it right away, but I always do my best as much as I can to answer any questions you might be having. Um, so always just, you know, reach out to me through my Instagram. Thank you so, Thank much. You so much. No problem. Take care. Bye. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.